Krishnamurti, in dialogue with Dr. Alan W. Anderson. J. Krishnamurti was born in South India and educated in England. For the past 40 years, he has been speaking in the United States, Europe, India, Australia, and other parts of the world. From the outset of his life's work, he repudiated all connections with organized religions and ideologies and said that his only concern was to set men absolutely, unconditionally free. He is the author of many books, among them The Awakening of Intelligence, The Urgency of Change, Freedom from the Known, and The Flight of the Eagle. This is one of a series of dialogues between Krishnamurti and Dr. Alan W. Anderson, who is Professor of Religious Studies at San Diego State University, where he teaches Indian and Chinese scriptures and the oracular tradition. Dr. Anderson, a published poet, received his degree from Columbia University and the Union Theological Seminary. He has been honored with a Distinguished Teaching Award from the California State Universities. <coughs> Mr. Krishnamurti, we were talking last time together about death in the context of living and love. And as I remember, just as we came to, to the close of what we were discussing, we thought it would be good to pursue this uh, in terms of a further inquiry into education. Uh, what really goes on between teacher and student when they begin looking Look. together and what are the traps that immediately appear and uh, shock. Uh, you, you, you mentioned uh, the terror of death, not simply externally, but internally in relation to thought. And, and uh, it seemed to me perhaps it would be a splendid thing if we just continued that and went deeper into it. So I would like to ask <coughs> why we are educated at all? What is the meaning of this education that people receive. Apparently, they don't understand a thing of life. They don't understand fear, pleasure, the whole thing that we have discussed, and the ultimate fear of death and the terror of not being. Is it that we have become so utterly materialistic that we are only concerned with good jobs, money, pleasure and superficial amusements, entertainments, whether they be religious or football. Is it that we have, that our whole nature and structure has become so utterly meaningless. Mm -hmm. And when we are educated to that, and to suddenly face something real is terrifying. And as we were saying yesterday, we are not educated to look at ourselves. We are not educated to understand the whole business of living. We are not educated to look and see what happens if we face death. So I was wondering, as we came along this morning, Religion, which we are going to discuss anyhow, has become merely not only a divisive process, but also utterly meaningless. 
maybe two thousand years as Christianity or three, five as Hinduism, Buddhism and so on, it, it has lost its substance. And we never inquire into what is religion, what is education, what is living, what is dying, you know, the whole business of it. We never ask, what is it all about? And when we do ask, we say, well, life has very little meaning, hmm? and it has very little meaning as we live, and so we escape into all kinds of fantastic, romantic nonsense, which has no reason, which, which is not a... we can't discuss or logically inquire, but is mere escape hmm. from this utter emptiness that one... a, a life that one leads. I don't know if you saw the other day, a group of people adoring a human being, and that's doing most fantastic things. And that's what they call religion, that's what they call God. Mm -hmm. They seem to have lost all reason. Reason, apparently, is, has no meaning anymore either. I did see a documentary that was actually put on by, by this station, uh, in which uh, the, the whole meeting operation was being portrayed uh, between the public and this individual uh, in this uh, young 15-year-old uh, guru, Maharaji. Oh, this, so and it, it was... Uh, Disgusting. It was, it was extraordinarily... Uh, it, Amazing. No. It, and, and, and it was, in many respects, revolting. And, uh, and that's what they call religion. Hmm. So, which shall we, shall we begin with the religion go on? Yes, I think it would be a splendid thing to do. All right, sir. No, I feel man has always wanted or tried to find out something beyond the everyday living, everyday routine, everyday pleasures, everyday, every activity of thought. He wanted something much more. I don't know if you have been to India. I do not know if you have been to villages. They put a little stone under a tree, put a, uh, some marking on it. Next day they have flowers, and the fourth day people are there, it has become divinity. It has become something religious. Hmm. That same principle is continued in the cathedrals. In exactly the same thing when you mass, and all the rituals in India, and all that. It begins there, the desire for human beings to find something more than what thought has put together. Not being able to find it, they romanticize it, they create symbols, or somebody who has got a little bit of this, they worship. And around that they do all kinds of uh, rituals, uh, Indian puja, you know, all that business goes on. And that's called religion, which has absolutely nothing to do with behaviour, with our daily life. So, seeing all this, both in the West and the East, in the world of Islam, in the world of Hindu Buddhism and all this, is the same principle going on. Worshipping an image which they have created, whether it is the Buddha or Jesus or Christ, it is the, the 
human mind that has created the image. Oh, yes. Oh, certainly. And they worship the image which is their own. Mm -hmm. In other words, they are worshipping themselves. And the division, the split, ah, grows wider. Ah, yeah. Yes. So, so religion, when one asks, what is religion? Obviously, one must negate in the sense, not brutally cut off, understand all this, and so negate all the religions. Mm -hmm. Negate the religion of India and the multi multiple gods and goddesses, and here the religion of Christianity, which is an image which they have created, hmm? which is idolatry. They might not like to call it idolatry, but it is. It is an idolatry of the mind. The mind has created the, the ideal, and the uh, mind through the hand created the statue, the cross, and so on. So, so if one really puts all that aside, the belief, the superstition, the worship of the person, worship of an idea, and the rituals, and the tradition, all that, mm -hmm. if one can do it, and one must do it to find out. Exactly. Th there's a point of, of terror here uh, that uh, is many, many faceted, it seems to me. It has so, so many, many different uh, uh, mirrors that it holds up to one's own dysfunction. Uh, to, to reach the place where one is willing to, to begin at the point where he makes this negation in order to find out. He thinks very often that he's being required to assume something in advance in, in order to make the negation. Oh, and therefore he balks at that, and he <laughs> won't do it. No, because uh, the brain needs security, mm -hmm. otherwise it can't function. That's right. So it finds security in a belief, mm -hmm. in an image, in rituals, in the propaganda of two thousand or five thousand years. And there, there is a sense of safety, comfort, security, well-being. Somebody is looking after the image of somebody greater than me, who is looking after me inwardly, he is responsible, all that. So, when you are asking a human being to negate all that, he is faced with an immense sense of danger, immense sense of... he becomes panic. Exactly. So, mm -hmm. to see all that, to see the absurdity of all the present religions, the utter meaninglessness of it all, and to face being totally insecure and not be frightened. I sense a trick that one can play on himself right here. Oh. Uh, again, I, I'm, I'm very grateful to you that we're exploring together this pathology yes. in, in, in its various facets. One can begin with the notion that he's going to make this negation uh, in order to oh. attain to something better. Oh, no, that's not negation. And that's not negation at no. all. The negation is to deny what is false, not knowing what is, what is true. Yes. To see the false in the false, and to see the truth in the false. And it is the truth that denies the false. 
You don't deny the false, but you see what is false. And the very seeing of what is false is the truth. I don't know. Yes, of course. Of and course. That, that denies, that sweeps away all this. I don't know if I make much clear. Well, I had a very interesting experience in class yesterday. I had given the class uh, an assignment. Uh, I think I mentioned this in, in uh, a conversation we had yesterday. I'd given the, the, the class an assignment to go and, and, and look at the tree. So, in, in effect, I'm making a report as to what happened after they came back. Well, one young woman uh, described what happened to her. Uh, and she described it in such a way that, that uh, the class was convinced, and I was convinced, that there was, no, there was no blockage of her looking between herself and this tree. Uh, she was calmly ecstatic in her report. Uh, that sounds like a curious juxtaposition of words, but it seems to me to be correct. Uh, but then I asked her a question and I said, well now, were you thinking of yourself as looking at this tree? And she hesitated. Mind you, she'd already gone through this whole statement, which was very beautifully undertaken. And I come along, uh, playing the role of the serpent in the garden, you see, <laughs> and, and I say, well now, it, well, might it not have been the case at any time when you were doing this that uh, you thought of yourself looking at the observer. tree? And with this hesitation, she began to fall more and more out of her own act. Well, we had a look at that. She and I and the class, we all had a look at what she was doing. Finally, she turned around and said, well, the reason that I stopped was not because of what went on between me and the tree. I'm very clear about that. It's because I'm in class now, and I'm thinking that I ought to say the right thing. And so I've gone and ruined the whole thing. <laughs> uh, it, it was a revelation not only to her, but you could see with respect to the faces all around the room, uh, that we're all involved in this nonsense. Yes, sir. A and her, um, her shock that, that she could so betray this relationship that she'd had in doing her exercise in just a couple of words uh, was, was Very almost, it was, it was, yes, extremely revealing, but at the same time, Desperately hard to believe that anybody would do such a thing to himself. <laughs> yes, please, please do go on. So, sir, that's it. Negation can only take place when the mind sees the false. The very perception of the false is a negation of the false. Mm -hmm. And when you see the, the religions based on miracles, based on personal worship, based on the fear that you, yourself, your own life is so shoddy, empty, meaningless, and it is so transient, mm -hmm. you are gone in a few years, and, uh, and the mind creates the image which is eternal, which is marvellous, which is the, uh, the beautiful, the heaven, and identifies with it and worships it. Because it needs a sense of security, deeply. Mm -hmm. And it has created all these superficial nonsense, a circus. It is a circus. Oh, yes. So, can the mind observe this phenomenon mm -hmm. and see its own demand for security, comfort, safety, permanency, mm -hmm. and deny all that. Deny in the sense, see, the, see how the brain, thought, creates the sense of permanency. Mm -hmm. 
externality or whatever you like to call it. Mm-hmm. And to see all that. Therefore, one has to go much more deeply, I think, into the question of thought. Mm-hmm. Because both in the West and the East, thought has become the most important movement in life. Right, sir? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Thought, which has created this marvelous world of technology, marvelous world of science and all that, and thought which has created the religions, Mm-hmm. All the marvelous chants, mm-hmm. both the Gregorian and the Sanskrit chants, a thought which has built these ex- mm-hmm. beautiful cathedrals, mm-hmm. thought which has mm-hmm. made images of the saviors, the masters, the gurus, the mm, the father mm-hmm. image. Unless one really understands thought, what is thinking, we will still play the same game in a different field. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Like, look what is happening in this country. These, un- these gurus come from India. They shave their head put on the Indian dress, hmm, little tuft of hair hanging down, and repeat endlessly what somebody has said. A new guru. They have had old gurus, the priests, oh, yes. the Catholic prophet, and they have denied them, but accept the others. <laughs> <laughs> you follow? Yes. The others are as dead as the old ones, because they are just repeating tradition. Mm-hmm traditionally repeating how to sit, how to shave, how to meditate, how to hold your head, breathe, and finally obey what the old guru says, or the young guru says, which is exactly what took place in, in the Catholic world, in the Protestant, you follow? Mm-hmm. They deny that and yet accept the other. But they want security. They want right. somebody to tell them what to do, what to think, never how to think. <laughs> no, this, this raises a question that I hope we can explore together that concerns the word experience. Oh, that's another word. It's, uh, it's amazing how, how often in these times, this word crops up oh. to represent something that I desperately need, which somehow lies outside myself. I, I need the experience of Quite an awakening. Yes. It, it isn't an awakening that I need, apparently. It's an experience of, uh, of this awakening. The whole idea of, uh, of religion as experience seems to me to need very, very careful thought, and very, very careful penetration, penetration quite very careful penetration. Sir, if I may ask, why, does, why do we demand experience? Why is this craving for experience? <laughs> we have ex- sexual experience, experiences of every kind, don't we? Yes. As we live. Mm -hmm. Insults, flattery, uh, happenings, incidents, influences, what people say, don't say, uh, we read a book, and so on, so on. We are experiencing all the time. Mm -hmm. We are bored with that. Mm And we say, we go to somebody who will give me the experience of God. Yes, that's precisely what's claimed. Yeah. Now, what is involved in that? What is involved in experience 
in demand in the demand for experience and the experiencing of that demand i experience what that guru or master or somebody tells me how do i rec- how do i know it is real and i say i it i recognize it hmm? don't i say mm-hmm. look i experience something and i can only know that i have experienced it only when i have recognized it mm-hmm. right right recognition implies i've already known recognize Re- recognize yes mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so i am experiencing what i have already known therefore it's nothing new i don't know yes you're making yourself very very clear so all they are doing is a self deception mm-hmm. it it is actually lusted after that's so oh, good glad oh yes yes the drive for it is extraordinary i i've seen it in in many many students who will go to extraordinary austerities really oh i i uh, know we we, we we sometimes think that uh, that young people today are are very loose in their behavior uh well some are but what's so new about that that's been going on since time out of mind uh i think that what is rarely seen uh is that uh, many many young oh. persons today are yes, extremely serious Extreme. about about acquiring something that yes. someone possesses that they don't have yeah. Yes. and if someone claims to have it naively they're on their way and they'll go through any number of cartwheels they'll stand on their head indefinitely I, for I've that seen, that lies I have seen all this. yes which is called an experience as such that's what I, that's why one has to be very careful as you pointed out sir to explore this world and to see why the mind why a human being demands more experience when he, his his whole life is a vast experience with which he is so bored mm-hmm. he thinks this is a new experience mm-hmm. but to experience the new how can the mind recognize it as the new and this is already known it I don't know if I Yes, yes, uh, and and there's something very remarkable here in terms of what you said earlier in other previous conversations that we've had in the recognition of what is called the new the linkage with old thought of old course. image of course establishes the notion that there's something gradual in the yes. transition yes that there really is some kind of genuine link here with where i am now and where i was before now i become the next guru who goes out and teaches the person how gradually to undertake yes, this discipline yes sir and it never stops no 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 i i i i do see that it's amazing it's amazing and driving down in the car this morning i was thinking about the the whole business of chat that that you mentioned the beauty of it all and since this is related to experience as as such uh, i i thought maybe we could examine the aesthetics in terms of where this self trapping lies in it and of course i i thought of i thought of sanskrit and uh, that that beautiful invocation that is chanted uh, to uh, the upanishad the isha purnam ada purnam idam purnat purnam udachyate purnasya purnam and it goes on and i said to myself if one would attend to those words there's the echo of the abiding 
through the whole thing, through that whole glorious cadence. And yet, within it, within it, there's the radical occasion to fall into a euphoria. Yes, sir. And somnolence takes over. But it's within the very same. And, it, and I said to myself, well, maybe, maybe Mr. Krishnamurti would say a word about the relation of beauty to this in terms of one's own relation to the beautiful when that relation is not seen for what it is. Since there's a narcosis present that I can generate, it, <laughs> it, it isn't in those words. The, the, uh, and yet we think that the language must be at fault. There must be something, there must be something demonically hypnotic about this. We, we do. And, and, and then the religious groups will separate themselves totally from all this. Oh, well, yeah, we sure. had a period in Europe when, when uh, Protestants, uh, Calvinists, wouldn't allow an organ, to, uh, no, no music. No music. Be because no. music is seductive. It's music. I'm not the self-seducer. It's the music's music. fault. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Let's, 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 let's look at that. That is just... It's as we were saying the other day, sir, beauty... can only be when there is the total abandonment of the Self, mm -hmm. complete emptying the consciousness of its content, which is the Me. Then there is a beauty which is something entirely different from the pictures, charms, all that. Mm -hmm. and. Probably most of these young people, and also the older people, seek beauty in that sense through the trappings of the Church, through chants, hmm. through reading a beautiful, the uh, Old Testament with all its beautiful words and images and all that. And that gives them a sense of deep satisfaction. In other words, sir, what they are seeking is really gratification through beauty. Mm -hmm. Beauty of word, beauty of chant, beauty of all the, the robes and the incense and the, the light of the... Mm, coming through those marvellous pieces of colour. You've seen it all in cathedrals. Notre Dame and oh, Chartres yes. and all oh, these places, yes. more. Yes. Yes. And it gives them a sense of sacredness, sense of feeling happy, relieved. At last there is a place where I can go and meditate, be quiet, get into contact with something. Mm -hmm. And when you come along say, look, all that's all rubbish. <laughs> it's no meaning. What has meaning is how you live in your daily life. Yes, sir. Uh, Th then they throw a brick at you. Of course, it's like taking food away from a starving dog. Exactly. So, this is the whole point, sir. Experience is a trap. And all the people want this strange experience which the gurus hand think they have. Which, which is always called the knowledge. Uh, Interesting. Uh, yeah, very, very. Isn't it? Mm. It's always called the knowledge. knowledge. <laughs> yes. Uh, in, uh, of course, I was thinking of our previous conversations about this self-transformation that is not dependent on knowledge. Of course not. not. dependent on time. No. And eminently requires responsibility. You see, and, and also, sir, we don't want to work. We, are, we work very strenuously in earning a livelihood. Hmm? Look what we do 
Mm. Year after year, year after year, day after day, day after day. Mm. The brutality, the, the ugliness of all that. But here, inwardly, psychologically, we don't want to work. We are too lazy. Let the other fellow work, mm-hmm. perhaps he has worked, and perhaps he'll give me something. But I don't say, I'm going to find out. I'll deny the whole thing and find out. No, the assumption is that the priest's business is to have worked in order to know so that I am relieved of that task, or if I didn't come into the world with enough marbles, then all I need do is simply follow his instructions, and and it's his fault if he gets it messed up. Yeah, and we never saw ask the man who says, I know, Mm -hmm. I have experience, what do you know? Exactly. What have you experienced? What do you know? When you say, I know, you only know something which is dead, which is gone, which is finished, which is the past. You can't know something that's living. Huh. You follow, sir? Yes. A living thing, you can never know, it's moving. It is, not, it is never the same. And so I can never say, I know my wife (laughs) or my husband, my children, because they are living human beings. But these fellows come along, from India especially, (laughs) and they say, I know, I have experience, I have knowledge, I will give it to you. And I say, what impudence! You follow, sir? Yes. What callous indifference! that you know and I don't know. And what do you know? It's amazing what, what's been going on in terms of the relation between men on the one hand and women on the other, or man and woman with respect to this, because a whole mythology has grown up about this. For yes, instance, uh, woman, we say, our sex says, uh, woman uh, is, uh, is mysterious. And never is this understood in terms of the, the freshness of life, which includes everything, not just woman. Now we have an idea that woman is mysterious. So we're talking about something in terms of an essence, which has nothing to do with existence. It's, uh, exactly. Isn't that what you're... That's your yes, yes, I, I... goodness me. And as you said earlier, we're actually taught this. This is all in books. This is all in the conversations that go on in classrooms. So that's why so I feel education is destroying people, as it is now. Hmm? It has become a tragedy. If I had a son, uh, which I am not, thank God, I would say, what, what, where am I to educate him? What am I to do with him? To, Make, m- make him like the rest of the group, like the rest of the community. Thought, memories, accept, obey. You follow, sir? All the things that are going on. And when you are faced with that, as many people are now, hmm, mm-hmm. they are faced with this problem. Oh, they are, yes. Yes, there's no question about that. And so we say, look, let's start a school, mm-hmm. which we have in India, which we're going to do in California at Oha. We're going to do that. Let's start a school where we think totally differently, while we we are taught differently, not just the routine, 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 to accept or to deny, react. You know the whole thing. So from that arises another question, why does the mind obey? Mm -hmm. I obey the laws of the country. Mm -hmm. I obey uh, keeping to the left side of the road or right side of the road. I obey what the doctor tells me. Obey. I'm careful what he tells me. If I'm little, personally, I don't go near doctors. If I do, I'm very careful. 
I listen very carefully what they have to say. I'm watchful. I don't accept immediately this or that. But politically, in a so-called democratic world, a ty- they won't accept a tyrant. Right? Mm-hmm. No, no, they won't they accept. They say no authority, freedom. But spiritually, inwardly, they accept every Tom, Dick and Harry. Mm-hmm. Especially when they come from India. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, the other day in, I turned on with London BBC and there was a man uh, interviewing a certain group of people. And the uh, boy and the girl said, we obey entirely what our Guru says. And the question, the interviewer said, "Will he tell you to marry? If he tells me, I'll marry. If he tells me I must stop, I will stop. Far. Just a slave. You understand, sir? Mm. And yet, this very same person would object to political tyranny. <laughs> Absurd. You? Yes. There." He will accept the tyranny of a petty little guru with his fanciful ideas, hmm? mm-hmm. and he will reject politically a tyranny or a dictatorship. If so, why does the mind divide life you, into accepting authority in one way, in one direction, and deny it in another? And wha- what is the importance of authority? You, that is, uh, the word authority, as you know, means the one who originates. Author. Author. <laughs> yes. And these priests, gurus, leaders, spiritual preachers, what have they originated? They are repeating tradition, aren't they? Oh, yes, precisely. And tradition, whether it's from the Zen tradition, the Chinese tradition, or Hindu, is a dead thing. Hmm? And these people are perpetuating the dead thing. The other day I saw a man, he was explaining how to meditate. Put your hands here, close your eyes. And yes, that's the one I saw. And do this, that, and the other. I said, Good God. It was appalling. It was appalling. And, and people accepted you, sir. And on the same thing, uh, there was this woman who had to run out of money and uh, hmm. every blessed thing, and she had nowhere to go to sleep and so forth. And hysterically, she was saying, I must. I'm in line, I've got all these people ahead of me, but I must have this knowledge. <laughs> I. M- <laughs> I must have this knowledge. The hysteria of it, the desperation of it. The, it, it That's why, sir, what is behind this acceptance of authority? You understand? The authority of law, the authority of the policeman, the authority of the priest, the authority of these gurus. Hmm? What is behind this acceptance of authority? Is it fear? Fear of going wrong spiritually? Hmm? Of not try, doing the right thing in order to gain enlightenment, um, knowledge, um, the super consciousness, whatever it is. Is it fear? Or is it a sense of despair? A sense of utter loneliness, utter ignorance. I'm using the word ignorance in the deeper sense. Of yes, the word, yes, I, I follow. Which makes me say, there is a man there who says he knows. I'll accept him. I don't reason. You follow, sir? I don't say. What do you know? What do you bring to us? Give to your own tradition from India. Who who cares? You're bringing something dead, nothing original, you follow, sir? Nothing real. 
but repeat, 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 repeat what others have done, which in India themselves are throwing out. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I was just thinking of Tennyson's uh, lines. Uh, that apropos of this, though in a different context, uh, when when he wrote it, there's not to reason why, there's uh, but yes, to do and the, die. The good old thing. Yes. Yeah. So what what is behind this acceptance of authority? It's interesting that that the word authority uh, is uh, radically related to the self. Yes. Autos, the the self. There is this sensed gaping void through the division. Yes, sir, that's just... Through the division. And, and that immediately opens up a hunger, doesn't it? And my projection of my meal, I've run madly to. You see this? When you see this, you want to cry. You follow, sir? Yes. I mean, all these young people, going to these gurus, shaving their head, dressing in Indian dress, dancing in the streets, and you know, the fantastic things they're doing. All on a tradition which is dead. All tradition is dead, if you like. And what, what, when you see that, you say, my God, what is happening? So I go back and ask, why do we accept? Why are we influenced by these people? Why are we influenced when there is a constant repetition in a commercial, buy this, buy this, buy this? It's the same as that. You follow, sir? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why do we accept? child accepts, I can understand that. Mm. Poor thing, he doesn't know anything. It needs security, it needs a mother, it needs a care, it needs a protection, it needs for it to sit in your lap and be, you follow, affectionate, kind, gentle, that it needs that. Mm. Is it, they think the Guru gives him all this? through their words, through their rituals, through their repetition, through their absurd disciplines, you follow? Sense of uh, acceptance, as I accept my mother and child, I accept that in order to be comfortable, in order to feel at last something after me. Mm -hmm. Mm? This relates to what you said in a previous conversation, when we looked into fear. Mm -hmm. The reaction of the infant uh, is a reaction with no intermediary of any kind, of his own contrivance. He, he simply recognizes that he yes. has a need, need. and, and uh, this is not an imagined want, it is a radical need. He, 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 he needs to feed. Uh, he, he needs to be affectionately of course, uh, held. Uh, the transition from that at, to the point where one, as he gets older, begins to think about the source of the meeting of that need. emerges as the image yes, that is interposed between the sense of danger and the immediate action. So, if I'm understanding you correctly, there's a deflection here from the radical purity of act. That's right. Sir. See, that's, that's and I've done that myself. I have done that myself. It isn't because of anything that I was, I, I was told that actually coerced me to do it, e even though what you say is true. We are, uh, we are continually invited. <laughs> it, it, it's a kind of siren-like call that comes to us throughout the entire culture, in all cultures, to start that stuff. So, so that's what I want to get at. Why is it that we accept 
authority. In the democratic world, politically, you would shun any dictator. Mm-hmm. But yet, religiously, <laughs> they are all dictators. And why do we accept it? Why do I accept the priest as an intermediary to something which he says he knows? And so it shows, sir, we stop reasoning. Politically we reason, we see how important it is to be free free speech, free, everything free, as much as possible. We never think freedom is necessary here. Spiritually we don't feel the necessity of freedom, and therefore we accept it. Any Tom, Dick and Harry is horrifying. The most I've seen intellectuals, professors, uh, scientists falling for all this trap. Because they have reasoned in the scientific world and are weary of reasoning. And here at last I can sit back, not reason, hmm? be told, be comfortable, be happy. I'll do all the work for you. You ha- don't have to do anything. I'll take you over the river. You follow? Oh, yes. Yes. And I'm delighted. So, we accept where there is ignorance, where reason doesn't function, where intelligence is in abeyance, and you need all that freedom intelligence, reasoning, in, with regard to real spiritual matters. Otherwise what? Some guru comes along and tells you what to do, and you repeat what he does. You follow sir, how destructive oh, yes, it is, uh, the thing how degenerate it is, that's what's happening. Endlessly. I don't think these gurus realize what they are doing. Uh, no. They are encouraging degeneracy. Well, they represent uh, they are a chain, a chain of the same. Exactly. So, I can we? So, this brings up a very important question: Can we educate? Can, can there be an education in which there is no authority whatsoever? I must say yes to that, in terms of the experience that I had in class yesterday. It, it was a tremendous shock uh, to the students uh, when they suspended their disbelief for mm. a moment, just to see whether I meant it when okay. I said, okay. now we must do this together, not, not you're doing what I say to do, do it to walk together. Uh, we will do this together. Mm, share it together. We, we, right. Uh, you, you will question, and I will question, and we'll try to grasp as we go along without trying. And I went into the business about let's not have this shoddy little thing trying. Well, try. <laughs> Quite <right. laughs> That took a little while. Uh, that increased the shock because the uh, students who have been, to their own great satisfaction, uh, what you'd call devoted, those who do their work, who make effort, uh, are suddenly finding out that that this man has come into the room and uh, he's giving trying a bad press. (laughs) This does seem (laughs) to turn the thing completely upside down. But uh, they, they showed courage in the sense that um, they, they, they gave it quite, quite. a little attention 
uh, before beginning the, the true act of attention. That's why I was using courage there, because, quite, quite, yes. because it's a preliminary to that. I, I've quite followed you when you have raised the question about uh, the relation of courage to the pure act of attention. It seems to me uh, that that's not where it belongs. No. But they did get it up for this preliminary step. I but then, then we ran into this, this what, what I think I called uh, in an earlier conversation, dropping a stitch, where they really saw this, this abyss. They were alert enough to stand over oh, the quick. precipice, and that caused them to, uh, to freeze. And it's, it's that moment that seems to me uh, absolutely decisive. Yes. That, that it's, it's almost like uh, one, one sees uh, in terms of events, objective events. I, I remember reading uh, the uh, Spanish philosopher Ortega who, who spoke of events uh, that uh, tremble back and forth before the thing Jumping. actually tumbles into itself. Well, that was happening in the room, but it, it was like water that, that moved up to, to the lip of the cup and, and couldn't quite yes. spill over. Okay. Uh, I've, I've, I've spoken about this at some length uh, because I wanted to describe to you a, a real situation, what was actually, actually happening. I was going to say, sir, I have connected with very many schools for forty years mm -hmm. and more. And when one talks to the students about freedom and authority and acceptance, they are completely lost. Yes. They want, they want to be slaves. My father says this, I must do this. Oh, my father says I won't do that. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. the same. Exactly. Mm -hmm. do, do you think in, in our next conversation we could uh, look at that, that moment of hesitation? Yes, sir. It seems to me so terribly critical for education itself. Wonderful. <laughs>